The internet of things sucks. Now this is an adage you've probably heard time and time again. In this video, we're gonna go down the rabbit hole of why this is the case. We're gonna talk about a zero day that was found in an IP camera that is now being turned into a botnet to DDoS or denial of service websites across the internet. We're gonna talk about the vulnerability itself. We're actually gonna reverse engineer the binary to figure out what's going on inside the camera. And then we'll talk about why this is such a problem and how maybe we can fix it. Now, if you're new here, Hi, my name is Ed. This is A Level Learning, a channel where I talk about cybersecurity, software security, a bunch of other cool stuff. So if you like that or just want to hang out, hit that sub button. I really appreciate it. Ah, uh, another day, another vulnerability. Uh, this one says, unpatchable zero day in surveillance cam is being exploited to install Mirai. We're gonna walk through what this bug is all about. And then I actually have the firmware of this camera in my virtual machine. We're gonna rip that apart and I'm actually gonna go through the binary and figure out exactly what the bug is and talk about honestly how ridiculous this is and how ridiculous the state of the IoT software ecosystem is. This is like unacceptable behavior on the part of software security companies or software companies. Um, and I want to just kind of go into it. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to give you a high level overview to understand what's going on here. Malicious hackers are exploiting a critical vulnerability in a widely used security camera to spread Mirai, a family of malware that wrangles infected IoT devices into large networks for uses and attacks that take down websites and other IoT devices. So if you don't know what a lot of that means, hackers are using vulnerabilities in Internet of Things software, and IoT software, to install a variant of malware called Mirai. Now, Mirai has been around for a very very long time. It actually goes back to like 2016, 2015 time period. Um, and I originally learned of Mirai when it took down DIN. Now DIN or DIN, however you want to pronounce it, is a, gi is a gigantic dynamic domain name provider, right? So it's a provider of a lot of the DNS resolutions around the internet. In 2016, the Mirai botnet was able to take down DIN or take down DIN. And what it did is it made it so that people just across the internet couldn't resolve the domains of basic things they needed throughout their day. It was a huge showing how a botnet, when properly targeted, could take out a huge swath of the internet. And if you dove into the Mirai malware, we won't do that today, but the Mirai malware, all it did was it would infect a device by guessing the default credentials of that device, and then it would log into that device and install itself and then find more targets and guess more default credentials. And just literally by doing like admin, 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 password, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, admin, ABC, one, two, three, et cetera, it was able to spread itself across the internet and shoot like gigabits, if not, I think potentially terabits per second at Dyn and take it down. So that's back in 2016. The malware has evolved. It's no longer just doing the password stuff. It's now taking advantage of vulnerabilities and installing itself into new hosts. And one of them here is this AVM 1203 uh, camera that we will go into the firmware of here in a second. What's crazy about this bug is that it is not your traditional uh, exploitation via a buffer overflow or a memory corruption, right? Typically, we have bugs where you know a programmer makes it pretty pretty easy to make a mistake where they don't check the bounds of their input and they co copy it into a smaller buffer. Because of that, uh, that allows us to get remote code execution or at least corrupt the memory of the remote process and do evil things with it. What is so bad about this bug is that it is what is called a command injection. A command injection is when a programmer uses a function like system or p open or exec and doesn't sanitize the input and what you can see here on to the side of my my fat head is when they do the action on the camera that i'm guessing like changes the brightness of an led instead of specifying a brightness value that would be the regular input of this they can input cd to temp w get a file chamod the file and run the file oh and then also remove it and output all of the standard error to null and that's it okay ta-da that's it, that's the brightness value is that string there. So what's crazy is that this is so easy to exploit for hackers because they don't have to know the version of the firmware, they don't have to know exactly how big the stack frame is, they don't have to know any of that stuff, dude. They literally can just spray and pray, and if the thing is vulnerable and they can reach this IP address, it will pull down the malware and it will be added to the botnet. And this is just how IOT devices across the internet have been for a very long time. I have an example here. This is an old router that I used to have in my house. I no longer have it as my house router for obvious reasons. Um, but that family of router, and if you can guess what it is in the comments, I'd be curious to see if you know what it is. Uh, every model of that router was vulnerable to a zero day for a decade. Things like this are common. Devices that are typically embedded in tiny, like this little board, for example, this is just like how it is. 
I wanna go into the firmware of this camera real quick and kind of show you guys exactly where the bug comes from. Now, real quick before you go, I wanna show you my website, Low Level Academy. It is my personal course website that I run where I teach people about the fundamentals of computers, right? I think if you wanna be a good programmer, you have to know how computers work at a basic level. Languages like assembly, languages like C will teach you that and you can learn that here on Low Level Academy. And if you don't wanna buy it, you wanna try it first, you can go and free preview it. You can go check out the lesson on load operations, learn about how assembly operations and ARM work to load data into registers. You can go do C and you can learn and see how arrays work, for example. If you wanna try it before you buy it, go give it a shot. You can't code efficiently if you don't know how computers work. And where do you learn that? On Low Level Academy. Thanks for watching, back to the video. So if you're not like a person who does security research and this may be like intimidating for you, I promise this is not a complicated process. I'm gonna do the best that I can to explain exactly what's going on. Um, but so here is the image of that camera. And so it was a camera from a Taiwanese company called I think AV Tech and it was an AV1203 camera, right? And so you can see right here, oh sorry, 10023. And this is the, the firmware image that you can download from the manufacturer website, right? And that's kind of like, I think issue number one, or not issue number one, but like a big symptom of a lot of the embedded things is people tend to find vulnerabilities in these so easily because these devices, the manufacturers allow you to go download the firmware, right? So by having easy access to the firmware itself, you can just go pull it and look for yourself and find weird bugs and things. To take this binary apart, because if you like cat this binary, right, and pump it into less, it's just, it's just garbage. Well, inside of the binary image itself, there are a bunch of interesting pieces of, of data about like the metadata of the image itself. It's the, the compiled date, the, the type of data that it contains, stuff like that. But there are ultimately data structures that contain file systems that contain the binaries that run on the device that we're looking for. Now, if this firmware image were in, uh, encrypted, for example, that'd be a problem. We wouldn't be able to, to take it apart because we wouldn't know the key. We wouldn't be able to see what's on the inside. Uh, but luckily, this manufacturer will, lucky, luckily for some, unluckily for others, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not encrypted, right? So what we do, do this little command here called binwalk tac me, which is a recursive extraction on that image. And what that'll do is that'll actually rip the binary apart and give us all the subsystems that are inside of that binary if binwalk knows the signature of them. So we can go into the file that was produced by this and we have a bunch of stuff that comes out, some header data, and then ultimately we have this thing called the JFFS2, journaled flash filing system, uh, the second version. And this is what's going to contain all of the binaries that run on this device, right? So we're gonna go into there. And I also downloaded Jefferson, which if you wanna play along, I guess, this is a binary. This is a program that does the uh, extraction of the, of the data, right? So we'll go into this file here, 2EA15, and this is just the offset in the binary that that file comes from. And then so in here, we have some of the files that live on that camera. Okay, pretty cool. So if we go one level deeper, we see inside of this, there's a bunch of files that are interesting, but there's no, there, there's, a, there's a bin folder, but there are some, there are no files in there, right? So we wanna figure out, okay, where are the binary files for this camera? Well, luckily we saw another file in there that's called app app.sqfs. This is a squash FS, which is a file system that is actually compressed when it's live and you can't edit it when it's live, but you can uncompress it and see what's inside the, the app, right? So we do app.squashfs, very good. And then we can go into the squash FS and inside of here, the bin folder is where we see all the programs that actually run the primary functionality of the camera. Now, the question is like, which binary has the bug? This is like, the, the entire job of security researchers and bug hunters and vulnerability researchers is that like they have to figure out where the bugs are. So like no one really knows where the bugs are. Luckily for us, the article that was written up by Ars Technica includes some data from CISA, which I think came from the security company that found this bug. Uh, the vulnerability lies in the brightness function within the file CGI bin supervisor factory.cgi. So what we can do is we can go pull up this binary factory.cgi and see what's going on. So let's go play with factory.cgi. So we're in here, we're gonna look for this file. We'll say find and grep for factory. Oh, look, factory.cgi, very cool. And it's CGI bin supervisor, so we're in the right spot. Let's run file on that file. It's a symbolic link to CGI box, interesting. So let's see what CGI box is, a 32-bit uh, ARM Elf that is dynamically linked and it uses UC libc. Okay, nothing too interesting there. But what we then do is we take this vulnerability, we take this binary that we think has a bug in it potentially, and then we go into Ghidra. Now, if you don't know what Ghidra is, Ghidra is the reverse engineering framework that was published by the NSA. Uh, it has the assembly output of the binary over here, and it does its best guess at lifting it into representation of what the C would look like, right? So this is the actual binary of the program. This is the best representation that Ghidra can make 
make of the C code. And I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in as far as I can, but if you can't see it because you're on mobile or something, I'm sorry. Uh, but if you are on mobile and you can see it, do me a favor, say thanks, Triple L. You're the best in the comments. Okay. Um, very cool. So what we're doing here is this is like the main function, right? You can think of this as main. You can tell that it's main because it gets called by the UC libc main startup, right? The first function call to that is always the main function. Ultimately, it sets a bunch of a bunch of environment stuff up, but the main meat and potatoes is going to be the function that gets called when it parses the name of the binary, right? So this is very common for CGI bin binaries. What they do is they parse argv0 and say, what is the name of my binary? Okay, because of that, I will perform function x, right? So you can see here, there's a lookup table. If my name is factory.cgi, I will run the function at this location. Okay, very cool. So let's go ahead and click on that. And then over to the right, we see the code of this function. So I'm looking for that white LED string or that brightness string, right? Because those are the two strings that are associated with the vulnerability. So it's gonna get the action variable, okay? Because we saw action equals white LED. So we can say that this variable here is gonna be the action and it's gonna do a stir compare on action for some value. Okay, that makes sense. Nothing nothing too crazy right there. Um, I am seeing debug functionality that is unauthenticated, so I'm already not happy. The code smell is already poor. Uh, but we can go down and we can look for the white LED function. Okay, very cool. So if stir compared to uh, action is white LED, that does not equal zero, we'll do something else. But if it does equal zero, I wanna go to the other end of this. So this is the code that will run if the white LED is the action we're doing in the factory binary. And I'm already seeing the vulnerability. Okay, so again, this is this is why this is a problem, dude. What it does is it gets the value from the query, right? It says query CGI value, it gets brightness, and then it just removes this one character, and then it SN printf that, so it puts that value from the URL into this string, echo duty ratio equals this, pumps it to this output, and then calls system on it. They do absolutely zero sanitization of the string itself, and because of that, you are able to arbitrarily inject code into this that runs on bash without doing memory corruption. And this is a question I get asked a lot, right? Like, would, would languages like Rust, would languages like Zig, for example, make the world more secure? And the answer that I give is 70% of the time, yes. 70% of the time, which is the percentage of bugs that are found that are memory corruption vulnerabilities, we would save the world with Rust or Zig, something like that, right? I know Zig isn't memory safe, whatever. Um, but these are the, the rare, I guess, in quotes, 30% that even if I wrote this in Rust, even if I wrote this in Zig, even if I wrote this in some other memory safe language like OCaml or whatever, because I did not do the sanitization of the input, this would still be vulnerable no matter, no matter how you spun it. Because I'm literally just effectively saying, hey there, user, I trust you to not put bad characters into this and go from there. Now, I would try to emulate this, I would try to show you guys this, but if you're in this world or you know anything about this, you would know that in, that emulating embedded devices is like very complicated. Um, and if you sit there, <laughs> fucking the midwit response of like, it's really hard. No, it's easy. You just have to stub out NVRAM and like run the device. And then at the end, it's like, it's hard. I don't want to deal with it. It's hard. Um, but this right here is where the bug comes from. They don't sanitize the input of that function, and so be it. Anyway, guys, that's that's the video. I just we we live in a weird world where we have like all these devices in our homes and stuff, and like I mean this is a this is a security camera, so I'm sure there are like corporations around the world that have these things and their businesses. I mean they're they're being taken over to you know spread a botnet. So obviously they're around, um, but it's just crazy that bugs that are so obvious and so detrimental exist like this. And there's like almost no repercussion, right? Like you would think a company should be held responsible for the damages of their stuff. Like Boeing, for example, got bopped because their planes are falling out of the sky. That's not great. Um, maybe companies should have the same thing when they have, and again, the, the question legally, I think it'd be like gross negligence. And to me, again, I'm not a lawyer. I have no power here, but like this, this feels a little a little gross negligency. So anyway, I don't know. If you like this video, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, and go watch this other video over here about a vulnerability that's equally as crazy. We'll see you guys in that one. Take care. Bye-bye.